Two weeks ago, we started going through the Olivet Discourse verse by verse. And as most of you know, the Olivet Discourse has to do with what Jesus taught concerning the end times. In fact, that's the name of the series, The End Times According to Jesus. Now, to be honest with you, most people get confused and lost whenever they study the Olivet Discourse. And it's all because they don't understand that Matthew's account of the Olivet Discourse is laid out and organized differently than Luke's account is. So when they compare Matthew's version of the Olivet Discourse to Luke's version, the events don't seem to line up. And at times, they even seem to contradict each other. But that's only because Matthew's account of the Olivet Discourse is structured and organized differently than Luke's account. You see, Matthew's account of the Olivet Discourse is laid out in chronological order. The events are. And he doesn't really deviate from that until he gets down to verse number 36, which is almost to the very end of the chapter. Therefore, since he started with the sign of the end of the age, he proceeds on with the next set of events, which deals with the tribulation. Because he's trying to the best of his ability to keep all of the events in chronological order. But in order to do that, he's forced to leave certain things out that Jesus said. Luke, on the other hand, recorded the part that Matthew left out because he doesn't care if his rendition flowed in chronological order or not. He was more concerned about recording it in the same order in which Jesus delivered the message. So at times, Luke's rendition of the Olivet Discourse, or the events, doesn't flow in chronological order. But when it doesn't, it's clearly indicated. Now let me show you what I'm talking about, because this is very important. I told you as we went through it, we would go slow and I would be repetitive, but I wanted to make sure that you understood it so when you're studying on your own, you don't get confused. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 7 through 9, and then we're going to compare it to Luke chapter 21, verses 10 through 12. Here's Matthew chapter 24, verses 7 through 9. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pranks. Now, that's pretty much the exact same thing that Luke said. He adds a few things, but I want you to understand it's pretty much the same thing that Luke said. But now, when you get to verse 9, it's totally different. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. Notice the word then. Then is translated from the Greek word tate, and it implies after. In other words, after the world war and the end of the age has begun, then they will deliver you over to tribulation. So Matthew continues on in chronological order, but as we'll see, Luke doesn't. Now look at Luke chapter 21, verses 10 through 12, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines. Again, that's pretty much what Matthew said, right? Yeah, you can recognize that part. They both said the same thing. But here's where it deviates, verse 12. But before all these things. Matthew said after these things. Luke said before these things. So if you think they're talking about the same thing, you really get confused. They're similar, but they're totally different. He says, but before all these things, pra de tauton pantone. In other words, but before the world war and the end of the age has begun, and even before false messiahs start appearing, here's what's going to happen to you. And of course, he's talking to the apostles. So Luke records something that Matthew doesn't. In Luke's rendition of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus backtracks and he tells the apostles, I want you to know what's going to happen in your lifetime. What's specifically going to happen to you? And that's why last week we jumped over to the book of Luke. It's because he included something in his rendition that Matthew didn't. Is everyone with me? Good. In fact, let me give you a little tip to help you understand the Olivet Discourse if you're comparing Matthew's rendition to Luke's. Because many times as you're reading through the Bible, you look at this, you go, I get it. And then you turn over to Luke's and you start comparing, you go, ooh, they don't seem to match up. It's not that they don't match up, they're just laying it out and they're structured differently. So let me give you a little tip to help you. 
Matthew's account is in chronological order for the most part. And again, the reason I say for the most part is because at verse 36, Matthew deviates from placing the events in chronological order, but he clearly indicates that he's breaking the pattern. Luke's account is in all probability closer to the way that Jesus actually delivered his message. But it's more difficult to follow if you don't know Greek. Not a problem for me, but for most people it is. But that's why we're using Matthew's account, if at all possible, and we're only going to Luke's account whenever necessary. In fact, we're only using Luke's account to supplement Matthew's, which again is necessary at times. Now, the bottom line is this. Matthew has parts of the Olivet Discourse that Luke doesn't. And Luke has parts of the Olivet Discourse that Matthew doesn't. Plus, Matthew records the events in chronological order for the most part, but Luke doesn't. So, to get a complete picture, you have to put both of the accounts together in order to supplement each other, but you also have to harmonize them correctly chronologically. And most people can't do that. That's why they have such a hard time with the Olivet Discourse. And when I say most people, I'm talking scholars, pastors. Seminary professors, they have a very difficult time doing that. And one of the reasons why is because they study it in the English rather than translating it. When you translate it, it's pretty easy to keep them together and harmonize them. Now, if you have a harmony of the Gospels, that's not going to help you because they don't do it correctly either. But anyways, having said all of that, we're ready to move on. And because we're going verse by verse, we're going to jump back to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and we're going to begin in verse number 9. Now, as I told you last week, verses 9 through 28 records the events that are going to happen during the tribulation. The tribulation is a seven-year period, also known as the 70th week of Daniel. At the end of that seven-year period, Jesus will return to this earth, and he will usher in the Messianic age. So when we talk about the tribulation, we're talking about the last seven years in this time period known as the present. Because this present age, the age we're living in, is going to come to an end when Jesus returns. And he's going to usher in what is known as the Messianic age, also known as the Millennium. So when we talk about the tribulation, we're talking about the last seven years in this present age. And at the very end, Jesus returns. Now, verses 9 through 28 explains what's going to happen during that seven-year period. And Jesus didn't go into a lot of detail, sad to say. He simply gives us a brief synopsis of what will happen during that period of time. In fact, keep in mind what I told you several weeks ago. I told you that the book of Revelation goes into great detail concerning what's going to happen during the tribulation. But it doesn't tell us when the tribulation will begin or if there's a sign to let us know that it's about to happen. But the Olivet Discourse is the exact opposite. It doesn't go into a lot of detail about what's going to happen during the tribulation. It just gives us the basics. But it does tell us when the end of this age begins and how to know for the generation that will actually see the return of Jesus Christ. There's actually a sign to let us know. You see, the Olivet Discourse is big on signs because that's what the disciples wanted to know. When they came to Jesus, they asked him three questions. And in those three questions, what they really wanted to know is, when will these things occur, and what's the sign that they're about to happen? So, the Olivet Discourse is big on signs. Now, as I said, verses 9 through 28 in Matthew chapter 24 explains what's going to happen during that seven-year period known as the Tribulation. And this section is broken down into two parts. The events of the first half of the tribulation are recorded in verses 9 through 14. The events of the second half of the tribulation are recorded in verses 15 through 28. Matthew's making it easy for us. So, let's start with verses 9 through 14. We'll go ahead and read all of the verses. Not to verse 28, to verse 14, because all we're going to study this morning is what's going to happen during the first half of the tribulation, the first three and a half years. Here's what Jesus said. Then, tate, 
after the world war, after we've started the, at the end of the age, then, the tribulation, you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world. So that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. Now, Jesus mentioned five things that would happen during the, la or during the first half of the tribulation. First, there would be tremendous persecution of the saints. Look at verses 9 and 10 again. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. Who is you? Followers of Jesus Christ. Then followers of Christ will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. You know, it's kind of amazing to me. The United States of America has always been a Christian nation. But for the first time in the world, it seems like the United States of America is not. In fact, if you're a Christian, you're seen as a bigot. There's a war coming against Christianity that we haven't even seen the results of yet. But it's beginning right now. And it says, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Now, this persecution is the result of the fifth seal being opened in the book of Revelation. When the fifth seal is opened, people start being martyred for their faith. Look at Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, this is the book of Revelation, I saw under the altar... The souls of all who have been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Then a white robe was given to each of them and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus who were to be martyred, had joined them. They're just the beginning. We'll find out a little bit later that there's millions who are martyred. But notice this. It says that when the fifth seal was opened. Now let me ask you a question. Why doesn't the persecution start at the beginning of the tribulation? Remember, it doesn't start until the fifth seal is opened. Which means you actually have four seals that are opened in the first half of the tribulation before you ever get to the point where Christians are being martyred. So why doesn't the persecution start at the very beginning of the tribulation? Does anyone know? I'll tell you why. Because at the beginning of the tribulation, there aren't any Christians. They've all been raptured. But by the time the fifth seal is opened, there are Christians on the earth again. Some of you aren't going to be raptured. You know about Jesus, but Jesus isn't the Lord of your life. And when the rapture occurs, you know you're trapped. That was the only way out. You only have two options, endure the tribulation or die during the tribulation. And as a result of you knowing what's going to take place, many of you will be saved. So you're going to see all of these Church of Laodiceans, apostate Christians, those who've never made Jesus Lord, turning to Jesus Christ. But at the beginning of the tribulation, there's not any Christians. The true Christians have all been raptured. Yeah. But by the time the fifth seal comes around, there's Christians on the earth again. And the persecution begins. By the end of the tribulation, the number of Christians who've been martyred is unbelievable. Look at Revelation chapter 17, verses 3 through 6. This is chapter 17 of Revelation. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns. And blasphemies against God were written all over it. The woman wore, wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. 
In her hand she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. A mysterious man was a mysterious name was written on her forehead. Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk. Drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. Now, if you've gone through the book of Revelation with me, you know that this is the woman who rides the scarlet beast. But what's interesting here is it says that she's drunk with the blood of martyred Christians. In other words, killing Christians is what drives her and consumes her. And everything she does is influenced by it. You know, sometimes the Bible uses the word drunk as a metaphor. And what it means is you're so under the influence of what you're doing that it's causing you to act and react. It's kind of like a mob mentality. Sometimes people get caught up in a mob and they start doing things that they would never do by themselves. In a sense, they're influenced by it. Well, the Bible uses the word drunk in that way. And what it's saying is that the woman, be, the woman who rides the beast, now, of course, if you stay with the book of Revelation, you find out that the beast turns on the woman, kills her and destroys her. But what's interesting is the woman that's riding the beast, she's drunk with the blood of the saints. Yeah. Second thing that Jesus says will happen during the first half of the tribulation is false prophets will arise. Not false messiahs, false prophets. Now, here's what's kind of interesting about this. Most of us, we're reading through the Bible, and we don't even realize that our brain does this, but we insert words for things that aren't there, or we're substitute words. Early on, earlier on, it, uh, it says that during the church age, there are certain general characteristics that will be during the church age, and one of them is false messiahs will come on the scene. And I made the comment that Jesus was the very first Jew that ever came publicly saying, I am the Messiah. And he actually fulfilled all of the Messianic prophecies down to the last day, the exact day that Daniel said he would publicly appear and he would officially reveal himself as the Messiah. Jesus came, said, I'm the Messiah. Israel rejected the Messiah. The religious, religious leaders influenced the people to reject him. But here's what's interesting. Jesus said, and here's what's going to happen. You're going to have false messiahs appear. And they started right after Jesus. Bar Kokhba was one of the very first ones. He's the one that started the Bar Kokhba re revolution. Yeah, rebellion. Why Rome had to come in. But what's interesting about that is, Jesus was the first one who ever officially revealed himself. Now, most of us, as we're reading through the Olivet Discourse and we get to the events that are going to happen in the first half of the tribulation, we actually read the scripture and it actually says false prophets, not false messiahs. But our brain will do what? We'll substitute the words. Look at verse 11 again. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. And without thinking, we think false messiahs. No, 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 not false messiahs. During the first half of the tribulation, many false prophets will arise. Pseudo prophetes, pseudo meaning liar, prophetes meaning prophets. So many false prophets will arise, but more importantly, notice what it says, and deceive many. Now most of you, because you've read the book of Revelation, know about the false prophet. He's the one who works in tangent with the beast in the book of Revelation. But you'll have other prophets working in tangent with the false prophet. So many false prophets will arise and they'll deceive many. If you've heard my teaching on Islam in the end times, you understand why many false prophets will arise. But anyways, that's the second thing that happens. The third thing that will happen during the first half of the tribulation that Jesus mentioned is a rise in sin and iniquity because sin will no longer be restrained. Look at verse number 12. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of, money, the love of many will grow cold. Now, I'll be honest with you. I look at today's culture and I'm thinking, how can it get any worse? How many of you old geezers are like me and you think, how can it get any worse? You know, I wonder if my parents, when they were my age, looked at my generation and thought that. 
But you know, I look at what's taking place and I'm thinking, how in the world can it get worse? But let me tell you, it's going to get much, much worse. Because here's what's interesting. Sin's going to be rampant everywhere, but the reason it's going to be rampant everywhere is because of the rapture. Yeah. Right now, believe it or not, there's a certain group of people that actually keep sin from going too far. But when that group of people is gone, sin will be rampant everywhere. Let me show you an interesting scripture. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. How many are familiar with the book of 2 Thessalonians? Let me explain something. Well, first, I'll tell you what. Let me just read this, and then I'll explain something about 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Here's what it says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. And you know what is holding him back. For he can be revealed only when his time comes. How many of you know who him and he is? The Antichrist. This is referring to the Antichrist here. So here's what Paul writes. He says, and you know what is holding the Antichrist back? For the Antichrist can be revealed only when the Antichrist time comes. For this lawness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Now this is a really interesting passage, and I'll tell you why. A lot of people who don't believe in the rapture, or don't believe the rapture will take place before the tribulation, they actually use this passage of scripture. But what they don't realize, it actually proves my point. It proves that the rapture will actually take place before the tribulation begins. But let me explain something here that most people don't understand. I want this to say, in 1 Thessalonians, the whole reason Paul wrote the book is because after he'd been at the church of Thessaloniki, he was teaching them about what's going to take place. He was teaching them about Jesus is going to return. And so what took place is, there's going to be a rapture, Jesus is going to return, the kingdom of heaven is going to be uh, set up, and then Paul left. And certain people of the church started dying, and that created all types of questions. And the questions were, well, what happens if you die before the rapture takes place? And so Paul had to write a letter to them, and that's known as 1 Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, what he does is he comes in, and he has to say, let me, let, let me just correct you here. The dead in Christ will rise first. Just because you're dead doesn't mean you will miss the rapture. And so this is what he writes. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring him back or bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on this earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And so the Thessalonians, well, oh, thank God. If we die before the rapture, we're still going to be resurrected. But then something happened. A little bit of time passed, and someone said, guess what? The rapture's already occurred, and we missed it. And so... All of a sudden, the Thessalonians freaked out again. Because now they, they thought, well, you know, the dead in Christ will be resurrected when the rapture takes place. But someone came along and said, the rapture's taking place. And they said, you missed it. And so Paul has to write 2 Thessalonians. And what he's telling them is, listen to me. You've not missed the rapture. If you had missed the rapture, you would have seen these things take place. Because the Antichrist can't be on the scene until the one who's restraining him leaves. So if they've left, 
you should have seen the Antichrist. He should have stepped on the scene. He should have made a seven-year peace treaty. You should have seen these things take place, and you didn't. Quit freaking out. That's what Paul was saying. So, that's what we have here. So, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6-8, through 8, he says this. And you know what is holding the Antichrist back? For he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work and will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord himself will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his message. Yeah. So, what I want you to notice out of this is the Antichrist cannot be revealed until his time. Now, I want you to think about something. We're the final generation. I'm going to prove that to you when we get to verse 32. We already know that we're at the end of the age. How do we know that we're living in the end times? Nation shall rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. That's a Hebrew idiom meaning world war. There's never been a world war to World War I. And World War II is just a continuation of it. And then he says this will confirm it. There'll be an increase in magnitude and scale in earthquakes and famines. And let me tell you, there have been. So we know we're in the end times. But how do we know that we're the final generation? When we get to verse number 32, what we'll find out is he gave a sign. When the fig tree blooms. And he tells you exactly what's going to take place. And he says, this generation will not pass. And it tells you when Israel becomes a nation, that's the generation. We're the final generation. May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation. If you were born after that and you live long enough, you're part of the generation that will see the rapture. Yeah. We're the final generation. But I want you to think about this. If we're the final generation, we're 2021. What does that mean? It means the Antichrist is alive and well on the earth right now. I mean, you thought about that. Yeah. When he takes over, he'll be in his 40s or 50s. He's a military genius. He's a financial genius. I started dwelling on this, and I was thinking, you know what? I bet you 10 to 1, the Antichrist has already been in the United States. He was probably educated at Harvard or Yale or Stanford or one of our prestigious universities like the University of Arkansas. <laughs> That's right. Why? Because... He's not a baby now. Right now, he's in his 30s or 40s. And he's on the earth right now. But he cannot be revealed until after the rapture. Because it's the Christians, the true Christians, that don't allow his work to be done. We are the one that's holding it back. We are restraining him. But once the Christians have been raptured, it clears the way for him to step into his position. And sin and iniquity will abound unlike any other time on earth, except maybe right before the flood. You know, I really believe this. I believe that the Antichrist will institute Sharia law, but he won't institute it until the second half of the tribulation. He's going to make sure that he solidifies his power. He will not commit the abomination of desolation until the middle of the tribulation. The first half of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to be solidifying his power. But let me tell you something. At the middle of the tribulation, when he commits the abomination of desolation, you're going to see something take place, and that's Sharia law. But that first half of the tribulation, when he's allowing and he's solidifying his power, He's going to allow everything to take place. Oh, yeah. The fourth thing that Jesus mentioned that's going to happen during the first half of the tribulation goes right along with the third. According to Jesus, sin and lawlessness will be so rampant that most people are going to give in to it. But those who don't give in to it and endure to the end will be saved. Look at verses 12 and 13 again. 
Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, the word endure is translated from the Greek word hupomena. And it literally means in this context to remain steadfast. So let me tell you what's going to take place. Those who miss the rapture but they know about Jesus Christ and repent, they're going to become Christians. But let me tell you, it's going to be so hard in the first three and a half years because sin is going to be rampant and persecution begin, will begin against the Christians because they're bigots. So what verses 12 and 13 are saying is this. Sin and lawlessness will be rampant. Most people, they'll give in to it. But those who refuse to give in to it and remain steadfast in their faith and continue to confess Jesus as the Lord will be saved. Those who give up and give in will be damned. Jesus also said that the gospel will be preached worldwide in the first half of the tribulation. That's right, look at verse number 14. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. Now those of you who are fam familiar with the book of Revelation know that 144,000 Jews are going to be converted and they're going to evangelize the entire world. But that's going to happen during the first half of the tribulation. There will also be two witnesses that will minister in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount during the first half of the tribulation. And even though Christians are being martyred during this time, they're protected. The 144,000 Messianic Jews are supernaturally sealed by God. Look at Revelation chapter 7, verses 3 through 4. Wait! Don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. And then if you keep reading, it tells you 12,000 from each tribe. Yeah. There are no lost tribes. I don't know why they made that up. Yes, you had the 10 tribes that were carried away into the, what was known as the Assyrian uh, captivity. And they went in there, but you need to understand, at the end of the Babylonian captivity, they had conquered the whole known world at that time in the Middle East. And when they released everyone to go back to the lands, those of the ten tribes were able to do so. That's why the, by the time you get to Jesus, everyone knew which tribe that they belonged to. Yeah. Anyways. The two witnesses also can't be harmed for 1,260 days. In other words, for the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Look at Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 12. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap, and they will prophesy during those 1,260 days. Three and a half months exactly. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. They have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them and he will conquer them and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where their Lord was crucified. And for three and a half days, all people, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them, and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, Come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. Of course, if you've gone through the book of Revelation, my series, you know that the death of the two witnesses actually kicks off the abomination of desolation. Yeah. You see, in the first three and a half years, they're in Jerusalem, and they're on the Temple Mount. 
And when the Jews who, who have been allowed to rebuild the temple, the temple will be in existence on the Temple Mount. They'll actually be sharing a spot with the Golden Dome of the Rock and the Al uh, Aqsa Mosque will still be up on there. But they'll be actually able to do all of the sacrifices because the temple will be rebuilt. But the two prophets will be there and they'll be showing and shouting out how each one of the mosaic sacrifices typifies, signifies, symbolizes what Jesus has done for us. Yeah. And they will hate that. But no one can remove them off the temple mount. No one can harm them. Because if they try, fire comes from their mouth. And people are so scared of them for 1,260 days until God gives the beast power to take their life. And they lay in the streets for three and a half days. But that's what emboldens him at the middle of the tribulation, the beast, to commit the abomination of desolation. And of course, at that point, the second half of the tribulation is going to take place. We're going to study the abomination of desolation next week along with the second half. But anyways, I'm getting off track. I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to do that. Let's go back to the Olivet Discourse. I want you to notice the last part of verse number 14. Look at verse 14 again. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. Do you see that? And then the end will come. Now most of us think we know what that means. We think that means, and then Jesus is coming. That is not what that means. No. Underline that word end. The word end is translated from the Greek word telos. And it's not referring to the end as a point or a moment in time. But it's referring to the last part in a series of time. So, what this is saying is that after the gospel has been preached throughout the world, then the last part of the end of this age will come. And what's the last part of the end of this age? The last three and a half years of the tribulation. Now people, do you understand the significance of this? Do you understand what this is saying? This is saying that after everyone has had a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, then and only then will the wrath of God be poured out upon the world. Do you realize in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, there's actually angels flying over that saying, repent, repent, repent. You have 144,000 Jews going out and preaching the word of God. You've got the two witnesses, and I'm sure they'll be on CNN, they'll be on Fox, they'll be on all of the different news channels, and they'll be showing what's happening in Jerusalem, but they're all teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're going to see one of the greatest worldwide revivals in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. But after the gospel has been preached everywhere, then the last part of the tribulation begins. The end. And it starts with the abomination of desolation. And when the Jews see it, we're going to find that they're told to flee. And at that point, it gets bad because at that point... The seven bows of revelation are poured out upon the earth. And it doesn't come upon just parts of the earth. It comes upon the whole earth. And the bows, of, bows that are talked about in the book of Revelation are actually the bows of wrath. It's God's wrath being poured out upon the world. Everyone has had a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. That's what I love about God. You know, we think sometimes, God, why don't you step in? Why don't you do something? If you've ever had a loved one dying of cancer and you all upset with God, people, let me tell you something. Cancer is not going to be cured completely and totally and out of the picture until Christ returns. And trust me, Jesus wants to return. But there's a scripture says that says, God is not slack concerning his promises but he's long-suffering he's patient not willing that any should perish you want to know why Jesus hasn't come back yet 
It's because he wants to give everyone an opportunity to be saved. And when we get to the tribulation, we still see that that's true. That's God's character. In the first three and a half years of the tribulation, yes, there are certain things being poured out upon the earth, but it's only coming in pockets and places. But the whole thing that Jesus is wanting is for people to be saved. So the gospel goes to every nation on the earth. And when all the gospels have had a chance, or all the nations have had a chance to, to respond to the gospel and, and to be saved, then and only then does the last part come and God's wrath is poured out upon the earth. So, everyone has a chance to hear the gospel in the first three and a half years of tribulation, and then the end will come. The last three and a half years of tribulation. At that point, God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, upon the world. So, Jesus said five things will happen during the first half of the tribulation. If you're taking notes, write these down. They're not going to come up as bullet points, but I'll go slow enough to make sure you get them. First, there will be tremendous persecution of the saints. Christians will be martyred. Yeah. The ones who missed the rapture realize they missed it. Realize Jesus was Lord. They make Lord, Jesus Lord of their lives. Let me tell you, they're going to have to face persecution. Yeah. Secondly, many false prophets will arise. But more importantly, and worse, they will deceive many. Thirdly, there will be a rise in sin and iniquity because sin will no longer be restrained. The ones who want to restrain them are now being persecuted. So in the first three and a half years, as the Antichrist is solidifying his power, he allows all types of immorality. You won't see that in the second half. It'll be just as wicked and worse, except he's going to go after just about everyone. As a result, most people are going to give in to the sin. But those who don't give in to it and endure to the end will be saved. Fourthly, the gospel will be preached worldwide in the first half of the tribulation. Yeah. And then, number five, the end will come, the last part of the tribulation, which is what we're going to look at next week. Let's stand. What's interesting about the Olivet Discourse when you compare it to the book of Revelation, if you went through the book of Revelation with me, you know how long it took as we went verse by verse through it. And the book of Revelation goes into such detail. And we're finding out exactly what's going to happen. But you know what's interesting? In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus doesn't care so much about what's going to happen as to who it's going to happen to. You know what that means? Jesus is more concerned about people than things. In the book of Revelation, we're all about this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. In the Olivet Discourse, it's all about who it's going to happen to. Yeah. Yeah. Christians are going to be persecuted. False prophets are going to rise and deceive people. Yeah. Sin's going to be rampant. Don't give in to it. Endure so you can be saved. The gospel's going to be preached to people. And then the end comes. Don't want to be here. Going to get bad. But in the Olivet Discourse, what Jesus is concerned about is people. If you're here this morning, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you, the most important thing in life is not your career, even though that's important. It's not your spouse, even though you're one flesh. Not even your children. The most important thing is your relationship with God. Because if you have a right relationship with God, it affects your job, it affects your spouse, it affects your children. The most important thing you can have is a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. And God has been patient 
allowing this sin to continue on and to go. And I kind of think that we're going to get to the very end of the time frame before everything happens because I know God. And God's going to just eke it out, giving everyone as much time as possible. But don't take that for granted because you don't know what the moral holds for you. If you're here and you never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't have a right relationship with God. If you die, you're not going to heaven. If the rapture takes place, you miss it. But it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus came to pay for your sin, to pay the penalty, to be Lord of your life so that you don't have to pay for your sin and that you can go to heaven when you die or if Christ returns before then, you can be raptured. I want everyone here to bow their heads, close their eyes. If you have never received Jesus, I'm going to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. All you have to do is repeat this prayer. Prayer's not magic, but if you believe what you're saying, your faith in Jesus and by confessing him as Lord will save you. And if you're online, you need to say this prayer too if you've never received Jesus. Here goes. God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that my sin has separated me from you. But God, I believe you love me, and because you love me, you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. And I believe that when Jesus died, his soul went into hell to pay the penalty for my sin. But I also believe that when all my sin was paid for, God, you raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus... I believe that, and I want you to be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin, and please be my Lord. Thank you for saving me.